One of the things I learned really 1971 and then repeatedly is that surprises that happen in my lifetime happened to me. In many cases were for things that didn't happen in my lifetime, but happened in prior lifetimes, such as in 1971, I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, August 15th, Nixon severs the relationship between gold and the dollar. So essentially defaulting. And I walked on the stock exchange, I said financial crisis, and I would expect it to be down a lot. It was up a lot. I studied history and found that the exact same thing happened in March 5th, 1933, with Roosevelt doing the same thing basically on the radio. And then I understood things better. So what happened for me over the last number of years is there are three big things that are happening in my lifetime that didn't happen. And I actually found with research five. So the first is the amount of decreation and monetization of that and how it's carrying through the system. The second is the amount of internal political, social, economic conflict that is now going on. The third is uh, the rising of a great power to challenge the existing world order and the existing world power of China and the geopolitical in which, you know, when I was born 1949, four years after the new world order began in 45, and the United States, of course, was a much more dominant country then, had 80% of the world's gold, 50% of the world's economy, the monopoly on military power because of nuclear and all of that, and it's declined on a relative basis. And that led me to do research, which I needed to do the last 500 years of research to follow. I wanted to study the rise and decline of currencies, reserve currencies, and their empires that I went back. And in doing that, I also discovered that their acts of nature actually had bigger effects than the first three of those, even with the wars, because of droughts, floods, and um, pandemics. And then number five was the greatest, of course, is man's capacity to adapt and invent, because in one way or another, if you look at that, per capita income rises, living standards rise over periods of time. But these big cycles and these big events are dominant. So those are, I think almost everything can fall into those five categories, you know? So that's how I look at it. I think that um, we're in a period in which there's a supply and demand for debt and credit, because one man's debts are another man's assets. And um, that is making us move into a stagflation kind of environment. In other words, the trade-offs between the two will become more difficult. But I think that number two influence, the political, is the most important. I think we have been used to being in an environment in which economics ruled. You know, you'd have a global economy and um, those who could produce items more efficiently or cheaper would get the business and they would raise their living standards and other places. You know, it was a global competition largely run by economic considerations and resources would shift that way. I think we're now in, that doesn't exist as much that way. And there's been a transition to an ideological allocation of resources and so on, such as, you know, the um, acquisition by Elon Musk of Twitter. It's not a financial transaction as much as it is for the purpose it'll have controls and when we have the conflicts such as with disney and desantis in florida and those political ideologies it's the belief that um, economics has got to fall within that agenda that'll have very big implications i think and then of course this external looking at it year by year this is the third year of the expansion with a, a very aggressive monetary policy so we're in the part of the typical expansion where there's a lot of inflation pressures because it happened in a giant big way and where everybody's long the world it's the end of a paradigm because everybody believes that they want everything to go up and of course that creates a dynamic where policy is long everything goes up and of course that happens by creating money and credit and which creates debt and that dynamic means that you must have a decline in real wealth measured by that because that's the financial wealth has become enormous relative to the real wealth. Everybody who's holding bonds or assets, particularly the debt assets, believes or financial assets in general, which are just journal entries, their claims, but they believe that they can take that buying power and sell it and buy goods and services and they can't. And by its necessity, there must be negative real returns, negative returns relative to buying power. So if we take it chronologically, 
I think there's the short term cycle, which is usually the business cycle takes, you know, seven years on average and a give or take, depending on where you start the cycle, you would take a few years. I think we're moving along here quicker. So we're now going to be in a very tight environment and that changes everything. So when we look at the returns of equities and we look at the well-being of companies, you see that the cost of interest relative to the expected returns of equities creates a squeeze on equities, changes the economics. A lot of borrowing has been done at much lower interest rates and so on. The return on equity for a company versus the return, uh, the cost of debt is changing and all of those are changing. And like all bubbles or paradigm shifts, the mentality that did exist, we don't have to worry about inflation, cash is a safe place and so on, gets a shock. There's a punch in the face. There's been a 40 year bull market and there's a punch in the face to the, all investors. And when that happens, things that were never supposed to happen because everybody believes in the tech companies, which is the same as the Nifty 50 or the dot com companies, they get hammered, right? 75% decline in Heavywood's funds and so on and so forth. That causes the adaptation. So we're in the beginning of that adaptation. That is most similar, I think, to the 1970s period. And um, it becomes financial. So I think as we come to the 2022 elections, and that'll have economics and markets as a big impact, I think that you'll see greater political extremism coming out of that. Moderates are leaving, and even those who are running are populists. Populists are people who will fight to win and will not accept losing and will fight for their constituency. So you'll see more populism of the left and more populism of the right. So if I look at 2023, I look at 2024 and I'm worried about the neither side accepting losing. And I think that there's a big risk that the system is in jeopardy because history has shown when the causes that people are behind are greater importance to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. Um, those types of things change the world landscape. I'm emphasizing the United States and certainly Europe is in that type of a position. So I think that when I look at it, it'll be very important to not only diversify well, but to be able to be long and short different assets in order to perform well in that environment. My main things are first, cash is trash and that there's in bonds and debt, it's not gonna be good and the claims of financial assets. So either avoid those or position yourselves so that when those things operate and position yourself for inflation. So there are lots of investments pertaining to inflation and the big commodity cycles are reactive. There's a giant, just like the 40 year bull market and bonds associated with a commodity cycle where everybody adapts to that. Companies don't hedge, inventories are drawn down there's less investment in those things when that switches, switches to that kind of an environment. And the big overarching thing is that the amount of financial claims that exist, there's charts that I repeatedly show when I deal with the changing world order. What is the amount of financial claims, assets, relative to real assets? And you could see that through history, when those financial claims, it's like a, a bank has too many IOUs on its real money and that thing, then you always get into these environments where it's undesirable to own the debt and you have negative real returns. And so to position one's portfolio in a tilt that way. But of course, the way that we do it is to separate alpha and beta, right? So two parts, core, because we're all talking tactical. How do you create a truly well-balanced core portfolio? And we know that the typical well portfolio is not well balanced with its greatest vulnerability being in that upper right quadrant in our box, which is the inflation box. And we know that we're in that environment. So from a starting point of view, I would encourage all investors to look at those four quadrant box, that box that we have, rising inflation, falling inflation, rising real growth relative to discounted, falling real growth relative to discounted, and see what the biases are in those portfolios. I believe that now, you can simultaneously reduce risk and raise returns, reduce risk of that portfolio by having more in that upper right quadrant, rising inflation, and you will reduce your risk because if you look at your portfolio, typical investor's portfolio, that is the environment that it is missing. 
So you start with that. How do you get more neutral? How do you get better balanced? And you cover yourself from that exposure. And then you make your tactical moves around it. And the tactical moves, again, should not be in those decks. It should be very well diversified. I think that the social and political conflicts are going to be a big investment thing coming forward. And so that'll mean, the way I look at it is, I want to look at places that have good income statements and balance sheets. So when I say places, I mean countries, as well as individuals that make up those countries, the individual people and the individual companies. So do they have a good income statement, financial stability, if they have a good balance sheet, so that they can weather those things. And also, it's a sign of their productivity. Are they productive? And then number two, are they civil with each other? I really do believe that internal conflict and bad finances are going to be defining characteristics of where to invest or even where to be. And then if I carry that forward to the third, am I going to have a risk of being in an international war, an important international war? because that international war will raise lots of threats. So I want, when I'm picking those locations, I want to be the inflation hedge assets, well diversified, look to parts of the world that are not as plagued with this. So emerging Asia is very interesting. India is interesting. Look at neutral countries during that period of time. Watch out for government controls on capital markets, because that's the logical next step history has shown that. Watch out for foreign exchange controls, could be watch out for those things. So those are the themes that I think are most important and will be most important in investing. There are two purposes of a currency, which is a medium of exchange and a storehold of wealth. And we're living in a world where we have three major currencies are fiat currencies with the same kind of problems. So you can't look at one currency in relationship to another. I think people make a lot of mistakes of thinking, you know, it's an ugly contest. The questions that we're going to be in is storehold of wealth. Okay, what is your storehold of wealth? And a money is a storehold of wealth that also is widely accepted in other countries so that you can move it around. It's not just limited to currencies. Don't think that medium of exchange is the only important thing. So think about the store of the wealth. That's when we deal with the quadrant, you know, the four pieces to try to find a balanced storehold of wealth. And then you have to think, can I move that and sell that anywhere? Am I going to have the free capital markets to do that? Or are they going to be a problem? And I think we are entering a period where all currencies, the traditional medium of exchange type of currencies, are going to, a lot of currencies will compete. What will be the medium in which I could take something and go someplace else and cost effectively convert that into buying? Okay, the medium of exchange. I think we're in a storehold of wealth issue. In other words, focus in on that. And then, okay, your transaction cost of converting that storehold of wealth, a balanced portfolio, into buying power. And then you transact. Because even in the worst inflations, the worst environments, the currencies, most of the time, still could be mediums of exchange, even though they're devalued. So I encourage people to think about bad fiat currencies generally, and what the liquidity is and think about even what capital wars look like. Gold as a overlay on a portfolio, on top of a portfolio, works like an insurance policy. Gold is a dead asset. It just sits there. But it's always through characteristics that are limited in supply. One of the most important things, it's the third highest reserve currency held by central banks. And in periods of time of war or such periods of time of credibility, it is the medium, like they say, it's the only asset that you can have that's not somebody else's liability. That means you have to be dependent on them giving you it, you them giving you money or they're giving you something. And it is international, it can be moved, and it's tried and true in that regard. But its behavior is in very environmentally specific. So as a hedge asset, it's really like a great insurance policy because when the other assets go down, and so something like that, or the equivalent, plays a role in a portfolio, not as the core asset, but as the effect of diversification of asset. And that's, if you do it as an overlay, it's about 15% of the portfolio, not taking away assets from other parts of the portfolio. But I come back to my basics, which is the four quadrants, you know, the timeless and universal. The one thing that you can be sure of is that cash will not be the best asset class. And when you diversify, 
to a portfolio. So you've got a well-balanced portfolio of other things. It will outperform cash because it's the nature of the system. People, you know, the central bank puts money on deposit. People with better ideas come along, take elements of risk and it works. It works better than the traditional portfolio in the down moves by a lot. Like when the market goes down 60% or so, the worst cases are like 20%, maybe a little bit over than that. And it never stays there because central banks can't let capitalism, which is dependent on those other assets performing a higher return than cash, can't let that continue. So they come in there and they produce money and credit and it produces the pop.